I'm going to talk about the importance of managing data and protecting your brand. Basically, this is a business casing um, a quick masterclass, for want of a better word. Um, we said many times today, and Dan said it, that Data Vault goes far beyond just a data model. Um, we work with a very diverse range of companies across size, industry, and, and business issues. And uh, the thing that seems to bind them all together is the work that we do at Certus, maybe half of it focuses on the, on the technology aspects, the data organizing and so forth. A lot of the other work that we do focuses on helping uh, restructure. Myself in particular, I'm an account director for Certus, so I find most of my time is spent helping my clients, well, you guys, navigate the internal headache that is getting business cases approval for the work that we do. Jules mentioned that I uh, do some work on the side. I do get paid. Thank you, Jules, just to keep you honest. Um, I teach for the Fundraising Institute. I know the CEO. I worked with her for a few years, and they needed someone who could come in and help not-for-profit business managers just understand what their responsibilities are when it comes to managing data and what some of the potential risks are. So I've taken that course and I've distilled it down into a 20, 30 minute talk on um, how we can start building in particularly the impact of brand safety into our business cases uh, for data management solutions. Okay. <clears throat> so. It's almost obligatory now. We have to make sure we all understand what Industry 4.0 is, but this is, this is the kind of the crux of the whole thing. We have had three previous industrial revolutions, and each one has been called out by the fact that it had its own way of impacting upon uh, society as a whole. Uh, when we first started to get into uh, agriculture and then into uh, industrialization, that didn't just change the amount of goods we could produce, it changed how people were employed, where they moved to, family structures, the list goes on and on. And we are now in the fourth industrial revolution that is going to change the way that society tends to, to operate. For our purposes, we can consider Industry 4.0 has been constituted of five distinct defining areas. The first is artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence gets a lot of focus, and it's getting a lot of focus a lot because of the, the uh, impact it has on individuals, and rightly so. But again, a lot of the work that we do, and uh, the, the most of the work that goes on in the industry when it comes to artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so forth, is far more operational in nature. But the fact that we have machines making decisions that do affect individuals using data that we in this room have to manage puts this very much top of mind when we have to start thinking about the future and future-proofing what we build. The next one is, of course, automation. That's kind of a no surprise, but I'm going to talk a little bit about customer experience, and that's the crux of the whole thing. The consumers out there are getting very, very savvy. I think I have a prop. So this is a pair of JBL uh, Bluetooth wireless headset, uh, headphones. They cost me a little under $100 online. Uh, my previous pair got chewed by a pug. Yeah, it cost me a fortune. So I went online and I went around and I bought these uh, from a from a website. They're good quality, they work fine, uh, and if my dog chews them again, I'm not going to be too heartbroken because I didn't spend a fortune on them. The website that I chose, um, I won't name now, but I chose almost exclusively because of customer experience. I can go anywhere in the world to buy these. I can buy comparable products at almost any price point. So how am I going to differentiate I'm going to differentiate by the experience I get from the brand in question. So this idea of automation says, if you're going to impress people, they want a personalized experience. They want you to know who they are. They want you to know what products they like, what they don't like, how they want to be communicated, when they last complained. We were supposed to have from people from Telstra here. Do we still have, do we? Don't think so. But Telstra have got a very big problem. 
They started supporting phones, for God's sake, and now they're supporting some very, very complex technologies, and they're having to do so under a, a traditional paradigm uh, in terms of how they are structured, and they're evolving to, to meet those challenges. But automation is the only way we can scale up the, what we want to do for our customers uh, in such a way that we can meet their expectations. And if we don't meet their expectations, they will leave. They will go to another website, they will go to another store, and they will find a comparable product at about the same price point. The 3D printing phenomena, there's organisations now that are growing up because new capabilities are defined. Now, 3D printing is a case in itself. We are now at the point where there are organisations who can print a full house. And they are doing this, obviously, in developing countries, but the fact that the technology is there and we are seeing more and more use cases for 3D printing, we're seeing a whole new industry grow up out of that alone. I just entertained a, a, an exchange student um, from Japan, and she's a very big board gamer. Does anyone here watch the game, uh, the show Vikings? A couple of people? Uh, there's a game they play in Vikings called Nefertartal, or King's Table. It's a very old medieval game. I'm a bit of a nerd, so I learned how to play it, and I built a, 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 a board set, like a, a, a Nefertartal set. And so I played her and she really liked the game and I thought to myself, well, I'd love to be able to 3D print an Nefertartal set. There's bound to be somewhere out there. There isn't. But that's got to happen because I should be able to go in and 3D print my next screwdriver and my next wrench, etc., etc., because these are disposable items in my house. You can tell how handy I am. So 3D printing, we're starting to see not just that, but new ways of doing business, new entrants into the marketplace that are breaking the paradigm. We just had a financial services panel, um, and open banking is going to be a very interesting play. I use a, a platform already, it's an earlier adopter called Humanity, and I give them permission to bring together all of my financial information, they build me nice dashboards, and eventually they're going to start making me offers about how they can save me money. But that's the first business I've seen in this marketplace that's using the open data move to create a new business model that can um, offer new opportunities for us. Blockchain. Blockchain kind of got a real big focus and then it seemed to go away as a talking point, but it's still there. Blockchain, again, is offering ways for businesses to transact together that offers trust. Trust is a very, very rare commodity in a business-to-business -business transaction. That's why we spend so much on lawyers. But with blockchain, we can hard code the prerequisites for a transaction and allow the computers to monitor that. Just, I think it was just before Christmas, Jules, we were up at a, an IBM roundtable lunch. And in the room was a guy from one of the big four banks that is using artificial intelligence, machine learning, to monitor the performance of his suppliers and compare those to the benchmarks that are set in his contracts. Now, that isn't a blockchain example, but it's not too far away from the principle. Whereas he is a, he's using his automation capabilities, his technology, to see whether his suppliers are meeting their contractual obligations, because he wouldn't be able to do that if it was just him through manual processes. So blockchain's going to throw that up, and then, of course, we've got the Internet of Things. We've talked a lot about that. So what's the, what's the underlying thing here? What's the number one thing that links these all together? It's data. Data is hands down uh, king. And I think we've heard enough examples today that we are talking about organisations that if they don't get on top of how they use data in a meaningful way, will no longer exist. If you go back and look at the top 200, say, of the, t of the leading brands 50 years ago, they no longer exist. They're the codex of the world because they did not see the writing on the wall and they did not evolve themselves. So, Industry 4.0 is a useful topic with which to arm yourselves because it links what we do from a technical standpoint to business outcomes. This is what the conversation is at the executive level. This is what the conversation is at the board level. 
These are the worries they have. This is how their bonuses are going to get calculated. So the more we can link what we do to these big lofty goals, the better off our budgets are going to be. And it's not just, as I say, the operational side. Organisations spend a huge amount of time and money talking to their prospective clients and their current customers. Huge amounts. If they get this wrong, there's a huge amount of danger because people talk. Did anyone know the average time if you have a bad customer experience you'll tell people versus if you have a good one? Anyone care to guess? It's about, if you have a good experience, you might tell four people. If you have a bad experience, you're probably going to tell 12 or 13 people. That's just human nature. And we live in a world now where you can talk to hundreds of thousands of people with a click of a thumb, really. So thinking about the communication side of the business, what they're saying, when they're saying, how they're saying it, which again is underpinned by data, they're improving the customer experience as they want to retain and grow their customer bases. That all requires data. So this is where there is this untapped business case. It isn't just about governance, although governance is a pretty good reason to um, you know, manage your data. There are other implications that allow you to get other stakeholders to put a value proposition forward that says, I will support this move because it helps me in this way. I want to use an example now, but I want to be very clear. <clears throat> this is not, I repeat, not a Certus customer. Neither have I worked for them. I just have done research, and they are unfortunately a very public example of when data can go wrong. Back in, uh, it would have been about yeah, July, between June and October of last year, this organization lost one third of its market value one-third of its market value. Anyone have a speculation as to who this is at this point? Nope. Okay, well, I'm not going to... You know, because you took the logo out, you coward. <laughs> All right, so... <clears throat> the business was too slow to identify customer issues and take appropriate action. In hindsight, investment in monitoring and systems was not adequate for the complexity of the business. Does that give any clues? All right. Throwing the impact of legislative changes from protecting your super and putting members first, the higher capital buffer requirements in New Zealand the total consideration could be closer to two billion on Macquarie's assets. That's in terms of the cost to the business, two billion dollars, because of this was all off the back of the uh, the Crown, um, what you call it, review. Royal Commission. Thank you. Do we know who? Not ANZ. AMP. Who said that? Well done, sir. You get a complimentary tray of muffins on your way out. Yes, it was AMP. They had consistent errors, fees being misreported, um, failure to report errors to the regulator. But the real big thing is that throughout all of this, consumers, customers, were exposed to were some pretty bad press from AMP, and in hindsight, probably rightly so. So their customers left. The fines, the regulations, the impositions they were given, absolutely, that has a financial impact. But nowhere near as big as the fact that those customers are going to leave, they're going to tell their friends and family they left, why they left, and they are unlikely to come back. Why? Because there's no shortage of competitors out there that can step up and offer a pretty similar product at a pretty similar rate and, and results. So for this organization, Mismanaging of data was a really big issue. It wasn't the only issue. Let's be clear, there were cultural issues, etc. But from a data standpoint, they didn't have a single customer view. Anyone here put their hand up and say they have a single customer view? Yeah, I knew no one would be that. Really? Okay. Yeah, multiple systems, therefore it's not a single customer view. <laughs> right. Lack of agility. 
the, the way that this organisation was structured was highly traditional. They weren't geared up for making decisions quickly and they certainly weren't geared up for necessarily being able to read and interpret what data was telling them. Because they were in a, a business that's been around for what, hundreds of years, they knew what they were doing. Complicated products. The paradigm was shifting as well. Consumers want more say, more control over what they do. AMP lacked the ability of bringing that information to the fore and giving consumers, their clients, more access to the information. Partly that was because they had no way of supporting them. Because as soon as you give a consumer access to information, you've now got to support their questions. Digital strategy significantly trailing competitors. That's not just for this organization, but in the superannuation market, that's true across the board, because they've never had to know about data before. This was a mandated product. But in a world of unlimited choice or self-managed super, you better believe you've got to step up and offer some kind of service. Senior executives had limited trust or understanding of data. And really, that's at the fault of the data people ourselves. We have to do the work to educate, to bring people on the journey, to make them understand, because if without the trust in the data, everything that we do is meaningless. We're still gonna have people go off and think, you know what, I think Coke needs a rebranding, despite what the data would tell everybody. So yes, well done, this is AMP. But AMP just happened to be a very public business case, um, and we got an opportunity to learn a lot from them. The other thing as well is when you look at how regulation is evolving, it's all leaning towards greater agency for the consumer. The individual right over who has their data, how they are using it, the right to be forgotten, the right to change, the right to understand how a decision was made is increasingly driving regulation. So we've got a new growth um, in, in this interest of customer information, different to PII. All your past transactions that can be modeled out to build derived insights that predict future behavior. The trend is towards that should be your information to control and decide who has access to. Transparency, how are decisions being made about me based upon what? And I want the right to be forgotten. These are all things that are coming down the pike and will impact us from a regulatory standpoint. Same thing with open data. The government now are very big on wanting to open up their databases, not just to each other agencies, but to external organisations, and for them to be able to accept information from third parties as well to improve the models that are running. Customer data ownership rights, data transportability, I want to be able to go to my bank and say, give me everything lock, stock and barrel, delete it from your systems, and I'm going to go and give it to this organization because I think they'll do a better job using my data. Ethics and bias. I was speaking to someone earlier, Max somewhere, Max Tennant in the room. I, uh, I used to um, uh, run a training and development business on behalf of an industry association. So I've talked a lot about skills gap and and the, re the need for training and development and so forth. These days I limit what I say publicly mostly to the challenges of ethics and bias, but this is gonna be a big issue as well. There is bias in our data. Ask any female in the room and they'll tell you. Our data is misogynistic, our data is racist, our data is ageist. And that's not, a, you know, that's just the nature of who we are and the data that we've accumulated. But if we're going to start writing algorithms that make decisions about populations, then we had better understand, is there bias in what we're doing in the data and how do we control for that? And those organizations that do not do this have a very real risk because this is being talked about. Last year, American Express got some really bad press because they were f found to be making very, very different offers to people based upon largely their gender and age, interest rate differences. There was bias because their data was telling them to do that, but the public found out and they got a, a very severe smack on the risk in the media. It had nothing to do with regulation. It was purely a PR issue. Okay. 
So some helpful stats, and there are some websites you can get, um, you can go to, that provide this information. Forrester, 69% of US online adults shop more with retailers that offer consistent customer experience. It's a bit of a fuzzy statistic, I will grant you, but overwhelmingly we see this time and time again, that people are choosing customer experience um, as a means of deciding between their, their provider, mainly because the other points of difference are, are going away and largely being meaningless, because I can you know, choose to buy something from a variety of places. Customer experience lower the cost to serve. It does this because if someone has a good experience, if they've had all their questions answered, they'll go away and they won't bother you again. Somebody who is unsatisfied, somebody who has problems, somebody who feels that their uh, issues have not been resolved, they're going to come back and call again. And that raises the cost to serve. 14-point NPS. Most organisations now measure net promoter score, and they do so because there was a lot of work done that directly links net promoter score to shareholder value. It's a long and complicated discussion, but it's there nonetheless. So a lot of organisations now are looking specifically at the NPS as the lead indicator for their business. Again, we know that we can get a great response an uplift in our NPS if we are offering a better experience. Personalization, relevancy. CX leaders, this is people who genuinely focus on customer experience, outperform the market by 80%. One of the things that Apple did to, to dominate the market so quickly was their um, genius bar. You walk in with an Apple product and say, my iPod stopped working, they just swap the damn thing out and say, there you go. That's an amazing customer experience that must have cost them an awful lot of money. But damn, Apple people are loyal for that reason. 73% say it's very important to them and almost 60% say they will leave because of a poor customer experience. 60% of people will leave. There is no brand loyalty. I've been with my telephone provider for probably 15 years. I would leave tomorrow if I got a better deal or I felt someone else would give me a better customer experience. It's not just global. This is from research that um, actually I was involved with while I was with the association. Nine out of 10 customers in Australia say they're happy to pay more for a better customer experience. Just to get a better experience, they will pay more. It's got nothing to do with the product. Two out of three will leave through a bad customer experience. I'm calling bullshit on the last one. 90% of businesses uh, uh, compete on customer experience. No, they don't. They say they do, uh, but there's still some misunderstanding about what customer-centric means out there. But it's not just a global phenomenon. It's very, very real here. So I'm going to round up by now by basically pointing out that everything comes down to this risk versus cost equation. When you take your business case up the chain, this is the decision that's being made. How much is this going to change my total cost of ownership? Am I going to have to invest in software licenses? How much is this going to cost to build? How much is it going to cost to support? How many resources do I need to build it? How many resources do I need to maintain it? And what am I looking at in terms of upgrades and maintenance and retraining and et cetera, et cetera? So that's kind of a long list of potential uh, cost. So how much is it going to cost me to take action? But the next logical thing is, well, what happens if I don't do anything? What are the risks to the business by inaction? Well, I'll probably get fines for uh, privacy. Am I that worried about it, though? How much am I realistically going to get uh, fined? If you're not one of the leading brands, chances are you're not necessarily going to get a lot of public a um, uh, 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 risk of being found out, but nonetheless, it, that, that's the calculation. There are court actions that can be made. You could be told how you've got to change your business that, in, of course, could be very, very expensive. Resource costs and, and process. Is there things that will happen? Uh, are, are, you, are there efficiencies that could be gained? Am I going to have an opportunity to reduce my operational costs? How likely? Am I going to get caught? 
And this is a very real calculation. How likely is this going to happen and am I willing to take the risk? So basically what you have is a situation that if the total cost of ownership for doing something outweighs the cost of not doing anything, chances are you're not going to do anything. They'll put the money elsewhere. Who was telling me about... Um, Someone was mentioning how much money has just come down the pipe and budgets have opened up for all that lovely technology that allows to ingest data and organise it real quickly. Funny that, that now we have this side of the equation far, far heavier than this side of the equation. So, what am I suggesting? What am I advocating? Start adding the impact of the brand. Start putting in this, that risk factor, well, what if? It isn't just if, what if suddenly the Sydney Morning Herald announces that 10,000 names and emails of our customers who happen to be LGBTQ got out. Now, that's going to get you a fine and a slap on the wrist. It's also going to get you a lot of press. And a lot of people who otherwise might have purchased from you, might have been clients, I'll just go next door to a company that doesn't screw over LGBTQ people. Doesn't matter who was at fault, doesn't matter anything else, there's going to be a brand impact. So it's difficult to quantify and it's difficult to guarantee, but nonetheless, for each potential area of risk, adding in the impact on brand through brand, brand um, uh, perception, through customer defection, which We've got the data to show we can demonstrate what that will look like, means that we can start building business cases that stack up. On that note...